Okay, so I'm so pleased to welcome today to our show, Ron Butler. Hi, Ron, thanks for joining us on the Move Smartly show. Hey, great to be here. Thanks very much for having me. I love following you on your Twitter account at Ron Mortgage Guy, where you describe yourself as the big, old, overly opinionated mortgage broker who is worried about the future of housing for average Canadians. So can well, that, you tell that, us- that's, That does sum it up, right? Like I've, <laughs> it I've, does. Uh, I've, stuck, I've stuck by that for all this time, so. I, although I'm not saying anything about the big, old, overly opinionated part. <laughs> well, it's, um, it's, it's clearly obvious, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you tell us more about your experience in the mortgage industry over the years and why you've come to uh, to this concern about Canadian housing in general? Well, you know, I've been doing it for a long time, about 28 years. And some of the things that I've, there's just some dramatic changes, like set aside the ridiculously high prices, the batshit crazy prices. Okay. Set aside that. There's been just a tremendous level of change. And the most worrisome part about the changes is that when I first started in the mortgage business, very average people were buying houses. So you could be the sort of assistant produce manager at uh, uh, Loblaws and, you know, your spouse was the, was a nurse and uh, you could easily buy a normal detached home. Now you couldn't buy it in beautiful downtown Oakville or the prime parts of, you're not going to buy it in Rosedale in Toronto, but, you know, all over Mississauga, all over Etobicoke, all through Scarborough, um, very easy to buy uh, an average, medium, small, detached home. They were doing it. Like, I did it. That was my job. We got those people with very normal incomes, uh, starter homes, but not a condo to start or not a townhouse to start, like straight to a single detached home. Now, of course, today, that would be a ridiculous concept unless their parents co-signed and also gave them $400,000 down payment, okay? So that's wrong. That is wrong that in the course of a generation, 28 years is not eternity. Like it's not like, it's not like it was the first world war, okay? Like it's, it's a relatively short period of time in our country for us to reach this very strange moment that average people at best, can hope to purchase a tiny condo apartment. I mean, it's it's a massive change. And there's no rational person would say it was okay. Like, it's bad. It's bad for society. It's bad for every other aspect of our country. And, you know, the other element was, when I first started in the mortgage business, individuals who bought multiple rental properties were rare. They were like a unicorn. They were like a leprechaun. Like you had to look under a rainbow to find them. Okay. Today, it's like everybody, period. What their, their whole goal is, yeah, I, I want to buy a condo. Then I want to sell the condo. Then I, or I'll keep the condo and I'll rent it out and I'll buy a townhouse. I'll just keep moving up the property ladder. And oh my God, that is so different than it was. Um, and there's no doubt either that it's our obsession with real estate as a society in Ontario is, is not that healthy. You know, I'm always reading Twitter remarks, little posts about, hey, I'm enjoying a coffee in a cafe in Amsterdam. And the miracle is not one living person here is talking about real estate. Or I'm reading a, a Twitter post about, hi, I, you know, I'm here in uh, Austin, Texas, and nobody's even mentioning real estate. They're talking about it at, at our dinner party. I mean, it is like you start to realize that none of it's healthy, like this intense obsession with real estate, this desire uh, and combined with frustration of not being able to afford a home, the extremely high rents that exist throughout the GTA and throughout most of South, Southwestern Ontario. Hell, the rents are up substantially in Ottawa. I mean, and that's like a one company town. 
Uh, honestly, none of it's good that I can say. I mean, certainly it's not good for the people who are on the outside looking in. Maybe somebody who owns eight rentals that they bought between 2008 and 2011 thinks it's the greatest thing in the world. And they're probably right about that. But for the next generation coming up, like if I found it relatively easy to buy a single detached home, why should it be so unmanageably hard for the next 30 year old, 35 year old? I, I, I don't think it makes sense. An evocative picture. Thanks, Ron, that you're painting. Let's dig a little more uh, into how we got here, maybe in in a shorter time span. So after a, a low period of interest rates aimed at spurring the economy, uh, first after the uh, 2008 global financial crisis, and then more recently in the wake of the uh, 2020, at least start of the global COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen um, an incredible rise in rates last year in Canada. Uh, the rate climb was dizzying. Uh, and this happened because central bankers around the world found themselves suddenly fighting an overheating economy with rising inflation everywhere. So in 2022, last year, the Bank of Canada started its rate rise in its policy rate rise in March. And uh, at that time, the rate was at 0.25%. It continued to hike throughout the year. And in their last meeting in December, uh, we saw another uh, rate hike, and we are now at 4.25% uh, policy rate. That is the highest rate we've seen since 2008. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on these particular last 15 years. What are your thoughts on how these policy instruments have been used to deal with these various economic situations? Well, it's a good, it's a good point to bring up that in during the period in 2008 which was known became known as the world financial crisis we went through the experience of rock bottom prime rate and quantitative easing like the uh, attempt by central banks or the successful move by central banks to not only have an extremely low prime rate but also to buy up bonds for to create a, a price floor on bonds that pulled down fixed rates uh, very necessary in the United States because you know variable rates just went out of existence uh, in 2008. So we did the same thing. We had quantitative easing in 2008. We had ultra low uh, prime rate, and of course that was in response to a financial crisis. There's a great deal of similarity because the crisis didn't last very long in Canada. You know, prices fell, house prices fell. There were worries about unemployment. There were worries about the stability of the financial system. But in Canada, it was all gone in 10 months. It had all, um, at the end of 10 months, rates were ultra low. Prices essentially began to restore themselves. They only ever dropped 15% for a short period of time. And in fact, by the end of 2009, they were, they were right back to where they were. It was as if nothing actually happened. And interest rates remained low. And that was our first experience of a, the beginning of a, a severe price increase fell off again in prices fell again in 2017 2016 2017 in response to foreign buyers taxes in Vancouver and Toronto uh or in, in, in Ontario specifically uh and because the prices had gone crazy by at, uh, comparatively in uh 2015 2016. now let's let's go to, fast forward to covid uh, which was indeed uh, a, a worldwide disaster. I mean, you can't call it anything else. That's what it was. The government correctly reacted by dropping rates, starting quantitative easing again, stimulate the economy, serve to, because we told millions of people to stay home. We had 8 million people on CERB, which was necessary. And it took the better part of, a year to get through that sort of tough part of the COVID crisis. The interesting thing is, although real estate just ceased to exist for a few months because you weren't even allowed to go to showings, you couldn't even go look at a house, uh, it just came to a complete stop uh, for a few months. But then oddly by the summer, it started going again because in, in Ontario, at least, um, showing a home became a, like almost a, 
emergency service. Like you had to, you had to keep the real estate business going. Like it's interesting. Mortgage brokers were never ever required to stay home. You might no, know they were. Yes, they uh, were considered an emergency. Service. We, we we were yes. considered an emergency. We were the same as ambulance drivers and firemen. <laughs> yes, and, and if doctors. I recall, yeah, and if I recall, the rationale was that. Um, you know, people were so dependent on their sale, the, the purchases they made or selling their home to finance next yeah. purchase yeah. that, you know, stopping everything would cause uh, a tremendous uh, issue in Ontario. Yeah, the concept was just they wanted no disruption in financial services. That was the key, you know, and and, and bank branches kind of reopened almost immediately, right? They mm -hmm. were, I don't even know if they were closed for a day. They were just forced, you know, people, they put up the plexiglass shields, they did all they had to do, put in the, the the long gaps between people. And so financial services, that's fine. But the weird outcome was that eventually, by the summer of 2020, the real estate market was getting going again. Pretty good, because the rates were so low. Uh, there were various waves of COVID. But by 2021, uh, uh, from the summer on, from the summer of 2021 on, Real estate prices in southwestern Ontario were rising 3% a month. A month. <laughs> so I guess quantitative easing really did the job and uh, quarter percent interest rates. And in other words, for anyone in the real estate market, you could see a catastrophe just building up. I mean, mm -hmm. you, it is... It is it's the craziest thing in the world to think that really it's it's like the tulips in Holland of the 1600s, for God's sakes. I mean, like it's it's absolutely ridiculous. Three percent a month. It's just unmanageable. And of course, it came to an end. Um, the Bank of Canada announced the rise of rates with inflation soared. Wonder why? Wonder why inflation soared where there's so much money supply and so much action, so much renovation, so many people buying new fridge and fridges and houses when, and and uh, stoves and and fixing up their new homes and buying furniture for their new homes when uh, there was a shortage of supply. So is it it's kind of kind of amazing inflation went up? I guess it might not have been transitory. Like it just might not have been transitory. There's a chance of that. So what we saw was a string of errors on the part of our government and of the Bank of Canada, uh, a string of unforced errors. Um, you know, if, how, if house prices are going up 3% a month in September of 2021, what's the problem with announcing that there will be an end to quantitative easing? Because there wasn't an end to quantitative easing till, till very late why not announce the concept that, okay, we are going to move out of emergency interest rates and you can anticipate an, a small increase in prime uh, before the end of the year in 2021. What would be the harm in announcing that with house prices rising 3% a month? Like you would think people who had a strong awareness of the dangers, and that's what a central banker is supposed to be. He's supposed to be aware of the dangers of an overheated economy. We didn't see that. We didn't see that happen. So things got worse and worse to the point when, when they finally pulled the plug and said, we're going to have to start raising rates, and then decided that inflation wasn't transitory. It was very dangerous and very uh, a clear and present danger that they started, ra they, they raised one jump, 1%. They went up 1% at one point. I mean, unheard of. And uh, here we are uh, with the highest percentage increase in prime rate in the Bank of Canada's history, the highest percentage increase. Obviously, prime rates have been much higher in the past, but never this percentage increase from a quarter to four and a quarter, and maybe by next week, four and a half. Right. And so extremely quick. And not only, Ron, I think you pointed out on your Twitter, not only did officials not shift their language uh, when, the, uh, when the appreciation in the housing market started to show in 2021, it seemed like they doubled down on this yeah. idea of spurring on the economy. Why well, do you think that was? Well, I, I think it's a question of the people who are in charge of this stuff um, are completely unrelated to normal human activities, to normal work life, to normal anything. They are people who have really never worked 
outside of the public sector. You know, they may have gone to work for a think tank. They may have gone to academia, worked at a university. They may have. But the truth is, when you look at so many of these folks and they have such a long term association with government. And how, what, what, how much do you have to worry about in government? If you just move between government and academia, you can't really ever lose your job. Um, you, you know, the pay just keeps on coming. Uh, and no matter what economic disaster happens, you just keep getting paid. There's no layoffs. Like there's in the jobs that Peter Rutledge and, and Tiff Macklin have had for the last 15 years, there's no possibility of layoff. Sure. Tiff left the bank and he went to work in academia and then they just came back. Uh, but these people have never felt the pressures of, uh, competitive private enterprise. Um, sure. People say Rutledge worked at the bank for a while, at a bank for a while, they worked at National Bank, but it's a long time ago, a very long time ago. And the reality is they are not connected to the real world that we all exist in. Like if you're a real estate agent or a mortgage broker, you live in the realest world that there could be. I mean, you can be out at, you, you can see business drop 50% in six months, like every realtor in Toronto has seen and every mortgage broker in Toronto has seen. You can see radical changes in your uh, income and you can see radical changes in markets and understand that you have to react to them. Nothing happens to government officials. Like, it, you know, their lives don't change. It's just things just keep on going. And, and when they leave office or they, they leave their government job, uh, somebody picks them up to be a consultant. I mean, all of a sudden, the former Bank of Canada governor, Stephen Paulos, gets hired by people selling, I think, fractional ownership of homes to, be a, to shill that stuff and uh, pick up a few hundred thousand dollars of side gig money. Uh, so... Do these people really understand the stresses that exist for ordinary working people? I think the key answer is no. So they don't react in a normal way. So let's face it. If you were uh, a banker who had to approve mortgages and you saw real estate prices going up 3% a month, you'd be a little worried because that doesn't make sense. But by the same token, you don't have much choice. The central bank is laying on the power to you keep them going. And if you were to say, well, you know what, Mr. CEO, I think we should pull back because these prices are getting crazy. The CEO would say, well, what, what are the other banks doing? And you'd say, well, they're, they're going strong. They're not going to pull back. I think we should only us should pull back. Well, you get fired for that idea. Like you can't, you can't say that to the CEO because it's, it's not the way it works in a competitive marketplace. So the best answer I can give you is I believe these people are completely out of touch. Let me throw one other idea at you. We don't even have a full-time finance minister in Canada. Yeah, think about that for a second. Like uh, this is one of the most difficult economic moments in the history of this country. We have rampant inflation, far higher levels than before, soaring interest rates that are making it very difficult for people to hold on to their homes, some people, and big renewals coming through every day. When you come off your five-year fix today, you used to have a 3.29 rate, and now you're getting a 5.49 rate. I just talked to, just before I spoke to you, I had somebody get off the phone and say, yeah, they're offering a 639. Uh, holy mackerel, like that's uh, unbelievable. So to my point, we don't have a full-time finance minister. She's also the deputy prime minister, and she seems to be leading half of the efforts to do with the uh, Ukrainian war situation. So I don't understand how you can run a government with a part-time finance minister at this stage of the game. So yeah, lots of incompetence, lots of disconnect from how real people actually live their lives. And that leads you to some poor decisions and some ultra slow reactions. Like, I'll tell you what, uh, there's a few finance ministers we've had in the last two decades that if he's, they saw that prices for their house prices were going up 3% a month, they would uh, do anything to bring it to an end, do anything to stop it from continuing because they understand the danger of it. Well, I should disclose actually <laughs> that I am a, 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 a a former employee actually of Finance Canada and I've worked on Queen's Park and finance. And I, I think uh, many of your points are very valid. I think 
one of the other uh, issues that we'll have to dig into is there is a lot of data sometimes or information going in. That doesn't mean that it's being acted on. The way it does get acted on, as you point out, you know, some might argue in the private sector, the bigger the company, the less it gets acted on as well. But there is a real disconnect. Even if somebody does start to notice these signals, perhaps there are a lot of other considerations going on at the same time. In other words, there's a lot of visuals around how well you're managing to get Canada out of the pandemic. Are we the ones that recovered our GDP the fastest? And, and so on. So I think there's a lot of mixed signals, but I think there is tremendous agreement that, you know, a, a boat was missed, definitely. And uh, that has led us to the situation right now. So Ron, you already mentioned you're getting calls from clients, consumers. No surprise if you're seeing your mortgage payments go up uh, 50% uh, monthly. Uh, are you starting to see this distress, not only in anecdotes, but in the data? Well, there was a, just a tiny change in the data last month. The uh, big bank default rate went from uh, 14 basis points to 15 basis points, which is, I think, the first uptick in the last eight or nine months. But that's a very minor scenario. Here's one of the interesting parts about the mortgage business in the last two years. The, uh, the stress test pushed a certain amount of people to different site, type of lenders besides banks. Uh, it pushed people to alternative lenders, institutional alternative lenders, and also to private lenders, They're sometimes referred to as mixed mortgage investment corporations, or even to private individuals for mortgages. And now we're watching an unfolding disaster in that area in, in southern Ontario and the GTA. As house prices fall and interest rates rise, these people, some of these people are just asking for their money back. Some of these companies and, and individuals who did private mortgages are just asking for their money back. And so my understanding, Ron, if we can unpack this, because I think this yeah. would surprise people. Yeah. There are uh, when you talk about a private lender, you're mm -hmm. specifically talking about very small operators in some cases um, that are joining up small time uh, lenders. But in some cases, it could actually be I've heard lawyers, I've heard mortgage brokers who are actually operating as lenders. Is this is this what a private lender is? Well, it's both that and corporations with up to a billion dollars worth of assets under management. I mean, some of them are quite big. Uh, there, there's a lot in the two to four hundred million dollar category that of, of assets under management. Um, and, and all the way down, as you said, to just individuals, lawyers, um, people with uh, paid for homes and big lines of credit. And uh, they just lend privately through mortgage brokers or through lawyers. Uh, it's It was certainly a marketplace that grew enormously in the last five years. What's happened today, though, is that if you can get a GIC that pays 5%, and you were previously getting like 6.99 on your private mortgage, why wouldn't you just take the GIC and no risk? Uh, because the house prices have fallen and you don't want to, you, you, you're not sure how much more they'll fall. So Right. Maybe I mean, it was different. Step out yes. of the market. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you're you're talking about a time when people were running around trying to invest their money in anything sure. that would yield in the environment of very low interest rates. And uh, obviously, Canadian housing is very attractive. And in the GTA specifically, Ron, do you have a sense of how active that segment is? Like, how many mortgage brokers do you, uh, sorry, holders do you think are in represented? The last, in the last two years, I would suspect you know, as much as one and a half to 2% of all origination was some form of alternative lender or private lender. Um, now that 2% doesn't sound like a lot, but it's billions. It's billions of dollars in mortgages. So, And and my understanding is at renewal, some of these lenders will either say, you know, we just cannot renew your mortgage. If you are, are some just saying, we don't want to renew your mortgage. We're actually getting out of this type of investment. And yep. others saying you have to re-qualify at a much higher rate that people cannot uh, qualify for. We don't run into the, there's no requalification on renewal with an institutional lender. You, you're offered, all, all institutional lenders offer renewals to their clients. Uh, I'll break it down into two categories. There's alternative lenders. All, all alternative lenders are institutional. They are, they fall under, um, acts related to the bank act or directly under the bank act or they fall under the credit unions fall under provincial regulation but they're regulated lenders uh they just take a different approach to lending than a big bank uh which is sanctioned by the regulators 
And they will typically always offer renewal, but we've seen renewals go from 3.19 to, to 8.49. So that's uh, almost an unmanageable increase because of the uh, cost of funds as it's risen. Now we look at private lending. Private lending falls into the category that you just discussed. It is, we were lending, we were lending off our line of credit. Our line of credit used to be 3% cost, costing us 3%. Now it's costing us maybe up it's close, getting close to 7%. So we don't want to do any private lending anymore. And we're also worried about where house prices are going. So we lent you $200,000 a year ago. The mortgage is up for renewal. We just want our 200,000 back. And people in that position then would have to scramble to try and get in with an institutional lender, but they would have to qualify at, you know, re-qualify, presumably, to try and move. Yeah, if you want to go to an institutional lender, you'd have to completely re-qualify at a point where a 5.49 rate is qualified at 7.49. Due to the regulation due stress, to stress test. test. Or you could go to an alternative lender who is offering 6.49 but you'd have to qualify at 849. And you had trouble qualifying in the first place a year before. So and let's talk about that. Usually people, like what kind of people would go to the private lender in the first place? Because it is in some ways um, not as regulated in the sense that somebody could fail to renew you or, or do other things. Well, it's largely, it's largely unregulated. If you get a private mortgage through a lawyer, it's effectively a free-for-all. Uh, there's not even a regulator like who regulates mortgage. Mortgage works are regulated. We're regulated by FISRA, the provincial authority. Uh, if you're a lawyer, you just don't have to steal the money. I mean, that's the that's the limit of your responsibility. You just have to give disclosure uh, and just to your own uh, to the people who, whose money you're lending. You don't have to give a damn about the uh, person who's borrowing the money, and you have. There's no, there's nobody to go to unless you, you, you unless the person who's borrowed the money wants to sue the lawyer. There's no regulator to go to. The Law Society of of Upper Canada does not count, does not listen to those complaints. I mean, they're, you know, hey, I think the lawyer who who arranged the loan for me ripped me off. The Law Society says, well, you had independent representation, so we're not following up on your complaint. We don't understand what's going on here. Uh, it highly unregulated that particular venue, but. As we look at it, you know, these are just one year mortgages. They are fully recallable at the renewal point. I mean, that's just the way they work. And uh, so we we heard a story, for example, at Move Smartly, where someone might go for this kind of thing. If, for example, I think this person was uh, held a mortgage at Scotiabank, which has a variable rate uh, that operates more like a, an adjustable rate mortgage. So they started to feel the impact of of their mortgage payments going up quicker, perhaps than other variable rate holders. Hmm. When this person, I think, I believe, uh, went to uh, try and get a bridge, uh, uh, not a bridge, but a, I guess refinance or try to get some assistance, they actually did not realize that their own mortgage broker was actually lending them the money. They said that they had found uh, another source and it was only through, um, you know, another professional helping them that they realized that the home address of this private lender was actually their mortgage lender, a broker. The mortgage broker. Well, that's yes. that that's is actually against the rules. You have to fully okay. you have to fully disclose your own lending or a person in the brokerage who's doing lending. Right, uh, but it just seems like a very uh, murky space uh, well, that we might be surprised to hear about here in Canada because I think you know we think of. Uh, the U.S. as having those shoddy practices in 2008, which led to so many problems. Now, is the situation in Canada a lot, a, a lot smaller? You said one percent, or, or do you think this one, is one to two percent? One to two percent. One to two percent. Do you, yeah. or do you think this is something that could lead us to be more vulnerable in Canada? I'm specifically thinking about in the U.S. in the subprime period. We saw minority communities who also want to participate in home ownership being marketed to being, you know, uh, sort of lent money and teaser rates and things like that, which then led to, um, you know, home distressed selling being concentrated in certain areas. Is there any chance that this small part of the market here in Canada could result in something similar here? You know, are these private lenders, are, is it a, a, a means that certain segments of the market go to? Could this be concentrated somehow geographically? Do you know what I mean? 
Well, it's concentrated in the major metropolitan centers. Um, that's where the bulk of private lending occurs. Some some of it occurs outside in the smaller cities and, and in cottage country. But uh, the the quick the easy and quick answer is no. It's it's not a similar situation. The United States in 2006, 2007, 2005. Um, these were actual banks selling crazy mortgages. These were banks selling to people with uh, bankruptcy level uh, FICO scores, 100% um, financing, hand, self-declared income documents. Like you wrote oh, down- ninja, the ninja. The ninja. The yeah. ninja loans. You're, they wrote yes, down a yes. piece of paper. Hey, I earned this much. You know, signed, we're on. Okay. Uh, you know, that, that was that, it was that crazy. Like you, mm -hmm. you, I'm, I'm a bit of an expert on that incident in time and uh, it, there's no comparison to Canada. It's just on, in terms of the shoddiness of the underwriting and the preposterousness of the products, no comparison, not even close, but here's what, uh, you know, people uh, at move smartly talk about in, in other broadcasts is that, the marginal buyer is a small part of the market, but they have a major impact on price. If the last five people in your neighborhood all had to sell, they were forced to sell and they were forced to bail on their mortgage and they had to get the property sold and it resulted in an unusually lower sell price. And there's five of them in your particular neighborhood. The whole neighborhood just dropped like a stone in terms of value because in the mortgage business and the re real estate business, you base prices on comps. You base prices on what was the most recent comparable sale in that particular area. And if they all went, fell through the floor because they had to sell, it creates an unusual marginal price point and it affects the entire neighborhood. And is there a lot of, my understanding uh, from professionals in the industry is that agents, for example, there's not a lot of transparency in terms of whether certain geographical areas, let's say in the Toronto area, are more exposed to this kind of risk. It's hard to tell beyond a certain point uh, anything about the origination of, of mortgages. Do you have a sense that, you know, there are neighborhoods that are at, more at risk to this kind of, um, you know, either prime lending or people not being able to keep up? It's just unknowable. Uh, you know, the, the, the banks keep uh, a good records and keep good, do good analysis on the, their own um, activities in, in given regions and neighborhoods. But this private lending is by nature private. <laughs> there's, there's nobody keeping track of it's anything. It's in the name. <laughs> <laughs> Fair correct. enough. It's, complete, it's a complete unknown. Interesting. So let's uh, now talk about... Um, any other kind of group of borrowers that you are concerned about right now? So presumably, you know, everybody's feeling this stress of their mortgage payments going up now. But not everybody. Same time, if, you're, if you're, if you're, you have a five-year fixed at one seven nine and your renewal isn't for three years, you're not stressed at all. You're very happy. That's right. So that's what I'm getting at. It's a certain percentage of, of borrowers who are always coming up for renewal on the fixed side. Variable, obviously um, they will, you know, First, there was a bit of a lag where, you know, people just saw their payments kind of stay the same, but the less was going towards the actual principal. Now people are having to pay more to, you know, um, in some cases, banks are sending out letters just saying or automatically saying your payment will go up. So it's happening out there. But at the same time, a lot of people have seen, um, you know, equity increase in their homes because home prices did go up for a long time. So do you have a general sense of, when it comes to the more regular lenders, what category or what percentage of mortgage bar, uh, borrowers do you think would be at risk in that sense of not being able to keep up with their mortgages? That's a good question. It's 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 actually much easier to break them down by situation. We talked about the first situation as people who had been who had moved into the private lending or alternative lending space. There's a great deal of pressure there. Let's look at situation number two. Situation number two is people who purchase pre-construction properties. So if you've got uh, bought a new home uh, about one year ago and it will be complete by the end of 2023, you should be sweating bullets because you probably paid at the, if it's a detached home, you probably paid at the very top of the market. And in all likelihood, your appraised value at mid next mid this year, say it's Labor Day this year, is going to be less than what you paid for it. So you've got a, you could have a significant mortgage issue. 
Uh, you're also very distracted by the fact you paid 1.7 million for something that's now only worth 1.3 or 1.2. Um, it's it's a bad news story. So that's pre-construction. But we'll take it a few steps further. Even people who brought pre-construction townhomes a year and a half ago, same problem. People who bought semis a year ago, a year and a half ago, same problem. People who bought condos uh, five years ago, they're probably fine because those prices were so much lower. But what if those people bought condo apartments with the intention of never closing? They bought like three or four of these pre-sale units and said, well, it, it's always just made a ton of money. I'll just wait for a couple of years. The prices will rise and I'll just sell them by assignment to others and those people will close. Okay, this is a very yes. common practice, extremely common practice. And, over uh, and, and, and sorry, just to clarify, Ron, some people don't realize that when you're buying a pre-construction condo in that sense, um, the reason you think you're not going to have to pay for it is you're paying the deposit schedules, but you right. only get the mortgage later when you're closing most people. Four or five, so, six years later. Yeah, that's right. Right, right. So people it, traditionally this worked, not traditionally, but over the last 10 years, let's say five years, especially this worked. People were able to see an appreciation and you know flip or assign their contracts Correct. before they yeah. would actually have to qualify for a mortgage. Um, now, do you have a sense of how, you know, how exposed that sector is, that pre-con sector, um, uh, where uh, those assignment sales are? Sure. As we go through the year, uh, it gets worse as we go through the year uh, because we don't believe that rates will come down through most of this year. So it'll just keep getting worse as the market slides sideways. Uh, they're, they're, those people are, it's going to be that people who bought 18 months ago, bought 15, 16 months ago, is possibly the highest, one of the highest points in the real estate cycle, people bought condos just maybe four years ago. So yeah, they they didn't get as much appreciation as they expected. But the real key for those people in the apartment condos, and, and even some of the people who bought townhouses and semis is they never expected to close. They didn't expect to close. And guess what? They can't close. They can't get a mortgage because they already have too much too many other homes. They were just buying these things essentially on the assumption that everything was going to work out the same way it did in the past. Prices were going to go way up. They were going to sell them by assignment and uh, they were never going to have to take possession. Now they have to. So that brings us to the final category of people who have problems moving forward with their real estate is people who have a lot of leverage. So if you've got somebody who bought a home five years ago, six years ago, decided to buy a bigger home, took a lot, his house, house has gone way up in value. So took a line of credit on the existing home as a down payment on the next home and then rented out the existing home and got a very, had a line of credit on his house, had a variable mortgage on his house, and then also bought the new property to live in with a variable mortgage. <laughs> so house, well, yeah, I'm laughing, I'm laughing hard. but if you're one of those but people, it's, awful. Yeah, it's hell yeah. on earth. It's hell on yeah. earth. I mean, now, some of us laugh if you're con if you're very crazy. Like I can't sleep at night with <laughs> one mortgage. So uh, you know, it just sounds incredible. But this happens. Well, um, that's another that's another failing of the regulator. Truth be told, the department right, of and that actually the leads regulator. yeah, and that leads us to um, actually my next question for you, Ron. Uh, you know, you said that everybody, most people expect the bank to raise rates when they meet again next week on the twenty fifth. In addition to this. I hear that now maybe bank regulators are going to perhaps introduce measures for this kind of last kind of borrower. People who have a huge, I guess, uh, might say a huge portfolio of mortgages. Um, have you heard anything about that, about uh, policy changes to restrict that type of thing? Yeah, the the uh, bank, the um, office, the office of the superintendent of financial institutions, that's a mouthful. The office yeah, the, uh, superintendent of financial institutions. <laughs> the, actual, the actual superintendent's a man named Peter Rutledge. Peter Rutledge announced uh, late last week that they were opening up discussions for a additional tightening of mortgage rules to ensure that there was a better relationship, a more favorable to the bank relationship. In other words, a safer relationship between the amount of lending people could receive and what their actual incomes were. Now, we always sort of had that. We had debt servicing ratios. We've always had mm -hmm. that since day one in the mortgage business. But unfortunately, because of the complexity of rules and this sort of a new phase that people got into where they were taking HELOCs out of their homes and then getting down payment for a rental property. And in some cases that was 
that's a hundred percent financing, right? Because if we get yes. a heat on the house and then mm -hmm. uh, we've now put that as the down payment, and now we get a mortgage on that property. Well, we had 20% down payment, 80% mortgage. Actually, we're paying payments on hundred percent of that place. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so what's happened that that has happened and probably a lot more than was ever expected. And so the uh, regulator is saying, well, we better take a closer look at that and make sure there's a tighter relationship of income to total debt. Now, this is a nice idea, but we actually brought up to this regulator, many mortgage brokers, many people in the industry brought up to the regulator two years ago that the real correct approach is prevent the purchase of a rental property with a borrowed down payment. It's a simple change. Mm -hmm. It's an understandable change. It's a change that doesn't hurt first time home buyers. It's a change that just takes leverage and stress out of the market. And of course, it was completely ignored. That's in fact, let's, ignored. yeah, and let's break that down, Ron. Now, that's actually a very interesting point because, you know, the down payment traditionally, the idea is that you put skin in the game so that Correct. you are less mm -hmm. uh, likely to uh, default on your mortgage payment. So it's like you sharing the risk with the lender as the buyer. Um, and uh, now when you're just borrowing that money, A, that risk is starting to, to be less for you. But secondly, a lot of the people that were able to do this were, let's say, uh, baby boomers or that age group, which who had realized a lot of equity in their homes. They have these HELOCs, which are the um, lines of credit that are against your uh, home values that you can dip into. And in many cases, I suspect uh, many of the help they gave to children and, and so forth came from these kind of vehicles. Yes. So in that sense, um, you know, we heard about bank and mo mom and dad, if you had one pricing out other first time buyers who did, whose parents or whoever uh, relatives didn't have access to that kind of financing. So you raise a great point. Not only do you kind of introduce risk through that skin in the game uh, reduction, but you know, I, I do wonder, you know, whether that is how a lot of these uh, bank of mom and dog financing deals went through. I, I, do you have any sense of that? Well, it, it, again, uh, it, banks don't track really this. They just track the fact that a gift happened. They don't track mm -hmm. where the gift came from. Uh, so we have a very limited view on that. Uh, all, but the most important thing to say is, if you're taking any money out of a home equity line of credit to provide a down payment, whether it's to your kids or on a rental property, that's leverage. And that is a, an effectively a double down on leverage. Now, let me give you the possibly the worst possible outcome. The bank of mom and dad takes a, out a line of credit to provide down payment for their kids. And because the price of houses is so incredibly high, they also have to co-sign with their kids so that they're, uh, uh, their their whatever income they're receiving and their pensions and their assets allow the that that adult child to be able to qualify for a mortgage on this very very expensive house in southwestern Ontario. Uh, that's about as leveraged as you can get. Uh, you're not only have you produced money for down payment, you've co-signed on the debt, and the crazy part about that co-signing is co-signing is joint and several. That means that. Even if there's four people on the mortgage, each one of them is responsible for 100% of the mortgage. Mm -hmm. There's no split up of the uh, of the responsibility for the payment of the mortgage. Uh, and heavens to Betsy, I mean, that's about as, as wild an incident of leverage and cross collateralization and also uh, added risk to older people that I don't think anybody really contemplated. So, uh, and it's, it, sorry, the sun's, uh, threatening to peek out in Toronto finally. So uh, um, it's getting a little brighter here. Uh, so if you see me squinting, that's why. Um, but Ron, to your point, it sounds like this wasn't well contemplated or well tracked. I mean, it sounds like not tracked at all. And now I suspect you might argue that any such measure that OSFI would introduce would be too little too late. Um, well, my, my, most, my recommendation, my most recent tweet was that OSFI, if you're gonna uh, insist on tightening up on mortgage rules, why don't you first step in and eliminate mortgage fraud by creating a direct link between CRA and uh, the bank lenders? So why we have the, we had this wild program about income document fraud that marketplace on the fifth the state, yes. right in the fall. Yes. Uh, and of course, everybody was up in arms. Yeah, we're going to do something about that. We're going to do something about that. Uh, 
uh, CREA or TREB, uh, Mortgage Broker Association. Oh, yeah, we're going to deal with that. We're going to investigate that. We're going to get after that. Hey, government, why don't you get the CRA link going so we can just confirm that the uh, tax documents that we were given, we don't need We don't need you to show us the tax documents, CRA. We don't need to violate any privacy. We just want to get you to say yes or no. We confirm that this number of net taxable income is correct or it's not. And that way we can identify fraudulent documents. Nothing's happened. Nothing's even come close to happening. Nothing is moved. Everybody just gave it some lip service at the time that the program hit. And then everybody forgot about it again. So, and Ron, would that be another category of vulnerability then? Because that's mortgage fraud. So presumably, yeah, uh, we're not even talking about the other categories we've discussed. Uh, we, the, you're talking about a CBC uh, Marketplace show, which saw, saw uh, people to, with no income uh, basically obtaining mortgages. I have to say, anecdotally, Move Smartly did hear from some consumers about this. And unfortunately, like a lot of these schemes, in communities especially, which are vulnerable or, or for whatever reason, I mean, you know, obviously tax fraud is tax fraud, but many people don't have the income to. Well, qualify, this is this is not this is not tax fraud. This is this is the creation of false documents. Those yes, people, false documents. Yes. Those people were paying their taxes on their real income. <laughs> they were okay, and they were okay. I see. So, but in other words, they were doing it to obtain a mortgage they couldn't right. really qualify that on the correct. income they were they that's were right. actually generating. So, yeah. um, on that's another level of of vulnerability. I suspect, like, what would happen to those? Uh, but like they don't have the income to keep up with their mortgage payments. Look, every one of these things is an added level of stress. When we talked, when we suggest, we've been suggesting the link to CRA for mm -hmm. at least eight years now. We have been we have been asking for it in the mortgage brokerage community. We've been asking for it. Just allow the big banks just to send, just to send a direct link to CRA. We're not asking for the documents. We don't need to see the documents. We don't need right. to see any of their tax information. All we want to do is they've given us these documents. The client has given mm -hmm. us these documents. This document says on line 15,000 says the net taxable income is $186,422. Right. True or, true or false. That's all you have right. to say. Just true or false. That's all the verification we need. We don't need to violate anybody's privacy other than... Mm -hmm. The documents they gave us themselves, that number is correct. And that's all we need. And it has been relentlessly ignored for eight straight years. So now the, uh, the regulators decided we need to tighten up on mortgage rules, but ah, we can't be bothered doing anything about mortgage fraud. <laughs> wow. So same, same way when we told them you should, you should eliminate borrowed down payment for rental properties, they said, Ah, uh, no, it's fine. <laughs> so it, it yeah. goes on and on. I mean, there is just right. a, a consistent ignorance of what actual practitioners tell them would be their best approach. It's completely ignored. Right. And as so, you know, uh, to sort of sum up on that, maybe, you know, we are not as exposed as the U.S. was because some of these crazy practices were being done by biggest banks and biggest lenders. Um, there is a vulnerable segment in Canada, and I suspect if you're doing these kind of things, you're already vulnerable. So in the in most cases, there may be some greed or other things involved, but uh, a lot of people are just stretching, trying to get that Canadian dream, and they will probably be knocked off that ladder first uh, as these rates rise, um, which is always the way, right? <laughs> and then there's oh, surprise and shock that the inequality will have increased after this downturn. It's, it is it is always, a, there's always a certain sense of amazement when government officials and regulators uh, point at something and say, hey, we just noticed this now, we should probably do something about it. Really? We've been talking to you about that for years. For they don't years. have a Reddit account? They should just go into any Reddit housing thread. Well, I mean, uh, I, 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 feel, I feel a little bad. Uh, you know, Peter, Peter Rutledge posted this... Uh, posted this the other day in his Twitter account and he got 34 likes. And when I suggested that they were uh, very wrong in the decision not to, not to eliminate this C CRA issue, that they were, they were wrong not to create the link that confirmed it. He got 30 likes to his, to his idea. I got 380 likes to my idea. 
So mm -hmm. in, there, there is a groundswell of ordinary people who are saying, wait a minute, you know, some of this regulatory stuff needs to be better thought out, needs to be more practical, needs to be more reasonable, and don't try to find a way to say no. Just, just if people are saying this will strengthen the financial system, mm -hmm. pay attention, pay attention. Yeah. It's not, it, it, every good idea doesn't have to come out of your office. You mm -hmm. can listen to others and make the effort to try to change things in a way that makes sense. That sounds like a, a good note to end on, Ron. Last uh, question I have for you. If you are somebody that is uh, a mortgage holder and you are worried about making your payments, you're having trouble keeping up, uh, whether it's a combination of payments or just your primary one, what should you start to think about? What would you advise right now in terms of what you should be looking to do? First of all, if you're going to have trouble making your payment, the first thing to do is have a direct, open, and uh, very honest rapport with your lender. You can't run away from your lender. Don't hide from your lender. Uh, contact them. Try to find somebody at a reasonable supervisory level within the, lend within the lender and see if there's anything you could possibly do to help. Lenders don't want to kick you out of your house. They don't. Well, maybe some of the private ones do. But definitely no bank lender has any interest in seeing you lose that home. They want to try to keep you in the home. They don't want to own homes. They want you to make payments. That's all they care about. Now, maybe there's some ways they can adjust your payments through change in amortization, through some other measures that they could try to help you with. You got to be, you got to have an open rapport. Next, is there some way to generate more revenue from your home? Is there an ability to get uh, room people who are boarders or some sort of tenants in the basement? Or, you know, is it possible to, to go out and get another gig? These a part-time gig. I mean, these rates won't last forever. You know, they they it's a it's a temporary issue. It's not going to be 10 years of five and a half, six percent interest rates. That's not going to be what happens here. So consider all those things, but number one, have a rapport with your lender, see if there's some way that they can help. Thanks so much, Ron. Ron, there was so so much discussed. I'd like to have this conversation with you again sure. to see whether we start to see, you know, some of the data on those segments that you talked about start to change so let's do this uh you know in a in a month or two and and oh maybe, listen uh, i i guarantee you this if you wait six months it's going to be a whole different world for canadian lending and mortgages i i assure you it's going to look yeah really so awesome. yeah maybe let's not make it that long i i've really uh found your your uh insights really useful to understanding you know i had to dig in because some of these things i think you know the average person doesn't realize um the different tiers of lending and the, the different things going on until a crisis hits and then oh, yeah. it's like, oh, <laughs> this is what the house of cards was all built on. So, uh, you know, I think it's important that we all become, even as citizens, way more literate about, you know, how these things are happening and, and structured so we can demand change. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, so I appreciate that. Thank you so much for your time, Ron. I think the sun wants us to go outside. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just toil away here in my little window. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I do. I just throw it away I here. Wasn't, yeah. That's all that happens here. It's been so great. I wasn't expecting that. Anyway, thanks again, Ron. And so uh, yeah, look forward to talking again. Enjoyed it. Great. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.